So, welcome to part two. So this part is about recipe development and how I'm choosing what I want to go in the beer and why. Let's start with the big idea. What is forest fire? What is forest fire going to taste like? What do I want it to smell like? How do I want it to feel when you drink it? Um, the big idea is a concept that I've taken from Randy Mosher's uh, Radical Brewing book. Um, he has said that in some ways, we work with flavour memory when we're trying to remember how something tastes, but you should use your flavour imagination, so try to picture what the beer actually will taste like. So what do I want Forest Fire to taste like? I know I want it to be dark, black, maybe a dark ruby kind of colour. I want it to be full-bodied with a good multi backbone. And I'd like the smoke that's there to marry in with the toasty malt that I hope to achieve as well. <clears throat> I know that spruce works well in dark beers because I've made one before, but that's going to have to be educated guesswork. I'm just going to have to see how that turns out. So on the whole, a thick, black, piney, creamy, smoked beer. It's going to be weird. But I think, in my head, I think it makes sense. So the first hurdle to un overcome, really, is, is the smoke problem. It's... Well, I, I like smoked beers. I've had ones from Germany, and I've brewed some myself, where I work. And all of these use beech wood smoked malt. One of my colleagues described this as quite a robust flavour, and, and it is. Um, used in excess, it can make the beer remind you of sausages and barbecue. Uh, used subtly, it can give a nice sort of warmth to a beer, but I actually felt like this beechwood smoke is, is so robust that it just probably wouldn't be right for the spruce. Spruce is quite delicate and quite fruity. So I had to overcome this problem with getting a smoke flavour into the beer, one that wasn't too robust, uh, that would just maybe impart a mild fruitiness, something like that. I tried smoked tea at first, I got the idea from Chop and Brew. Uh, they did a video with Jessica Hanley from Tea Source where they talked about putting various sorts of teas into beer, one of which was a smoked tea called Lapsang Souchong. So I bought some of that tea. Emily made me put it on the top shelf because it stank out the cupboard though. That's a tea that's smoked over, I think it's over pine boughs and pine needles, so it's an acquired taste. It's... I also bought a couple of beers that used the smoked tea. One was Pope's Yard uh, Lapsang Souchong Porter, and I thought that the smoke flavour kind of got lost in a lot of the dark malts they'd used. It did have a slight smokiness, but yeah, it was okay. I then bought a Cloud Water uh, Lapsang Lichtenhainer, and that was a beer style that I hadn't actually heard of before, which is fairly unusual but that's very similar to a Berliner Weiss. So for those of you who are familiar with Siren Craft Calypso, like that, but once again, I thought the smoke flavor was quite subtle and was probably lost. While I was working on the trade session stand for my workplace at Reading Beer Festival, I met Andy Parker from Elusive Brewing, and he let me try some of his Cherrywood Road, which is a Cherrywood smoked um, Ruby Mild. At that point, it clicked this is the smoked malt that I need to use. It had such a lovely fruity smoke that was so far away from that barbecue kind of flavour that beechwood can sometimes give you. So I had to go out and buy some of that. So let's start from the top then. As a base malt I'm using this, this is Golden Promise. It's not the base malt that most brewers use actually. Most brewers that I know use Maris Otter, which is another variety of malt. So in for the taste test on this one. It does taste a lot like Marisotta to me. Maybe it doesn't have quite that much of a flowery flavour to it. But it definitely has that biscuity, very lightly toasted character. I might actually go as far as saying it is it does taste actually sweeter than Maris Otter. So why Golden Promise then as a base malt, and why not Maris Otter? Well, there's a book I've read uh, 
Uh, it's called Experimental Homebrewing, and it's by Danny Conn and Drew Beecham. And in there, there's a small excerpt by what I can assume is a homebrewer friend that they know, who has made an identical beer uh, six or seven times, but with various different base marks. And that's not really the kind of experiment that is very easy to do. A lot of people split their batches and put maybe different, two different varieties of hops or two different varieties of yeast. Splitting things at that base malt level means you do have to brew like six or seven times to get the same results, and you have to brew them very quickly so you can taste the beer um, on the same level of aging. So in comparison to the others, uh, this guy uh, describes Golden Promise as a very mild aroma, flavour is slightly sweet, yeah, a cracker sort of breadiness, grainy, sweetest of the six, and pleasant. But what he goes on to say, which is the most important thing for me, is that he thinks his favourite was the Golden Promise, but this is for, for this reason, the residual sweetness resulted in a fuller mouthfeel without being too much. And that is something that I am really looking for in my beer. So for thickness, I'll be adding a malted flaked oats, which, as you can see, it's basically oatmeal. That's all it is. Now, oatmeal does a very strange thing in beer. You may have heard of oatmeal stouts before, but it genuinely thickens the beer in the same way that when you make oatmeal porridge... Uh, it, it becomes thick. It's got quite a lot of starch in it, and all that just contributes to a nice, thick, full-bodied beer. So, tasting it. It's just raw oat. Well, it's malted oats, but it just tastes like raw oatmeal. I know it will do good in the beer, though. This is not the effect that it will have. Eating it, in this case, is not going to do a great deal. He says as he eats more anyway. So next on the list is Munich Malt, and this is actually dark Munich Malt. Looking at it, you wouldn't know it was all that dark. It's a very special type of malt, it's a high-dried type of malt, which means that the temperature in the kiln has been raised right at the very end to create a toasty flavour, noticeably toasty flavour on the inside. Uh, this will hopefully provide the backdrop for some of the spruce flavour and some of the hops that I'm going to use as well. So it may look like regular pale malt, but it has a completely different flavour. I wouldn't say it tastes like burnt toast or anything like that, but almost half done toast. And if you're thinking, this has all gone too far JD, you're sat at home alone eating grains out of the palm of your hand, you're right. Right, on to the dark stuff. So this is chocolate malt, has quite a high EBC rating, so as you can see, it will get quite a lot of colour into the beer. But importantly, with chocolate malt, it's not quite all the way roasted, it's not black, which means it will give you some dark, bitter chocolate sorts of flavours. Now that does taste like burnt toast. It's another one of those malts where I think the flavour that it gives to beer isn't quite the flavour that isn't quite the flavour that you get when you eat it. Uh, this will steep and soak and actually give a nice dark bitter chocolate sweetness, whereas this tastes really really bitter, really astringent actually. But I work with it quite a lot at work, and I'm I'm quite familiar with it. I know what it does. And going even darker, there we've got Carafa Special Two, which is a trademark of the malting company Veermann in Germany, and when they say special, they mean it is dehusked. Interesting thing about dehusking things is that it's actually the husk that carries a lot of the bitterness, so when the husk is ro uh, roasted, uh, that develops a very bitter, very astringent flavour, which actually puts off quite a lot of brewers from using large quantities of black malt. Um, so this will should give me quite a lot of colour, but not a huge amount of bitterness, but maybe add on top, just layer that dark chocolate flavour I'm looking for. Right, now... Ooh, actually. I was just about to say now we're really in burnt toast territory, but we're not. The chocolate malt is actually a lot more bitter to the taste when you eat it than this is. And I think that is partly to do with the dehusking. In fact, probably wholly to do with the dehusking. You know, those those bitter compounds that are going to be inside the husks, I just aren't here anymore. Hmm. 
So I'll be using this mainly for colour, I think. So here it is. This is the Bryce Cherrywood Smoke Malt. I actually had to get it through a different homebrew shop than I normally go through. It's quite hard to get hold of, and I can imagine that if you are a brewer using this, a commercial brewer, yeah, it must be a nightmare to get hold of in the UK, because getting hold of just, you know, 500 grams, and I've got another one over there, getting hold of about a kilo of it isn't all that easy. So let's have a look. And now, once again, that looks like pale malt to me, but I know that smoking doesn't really change the colour very much at all. So, the taste test will be the key. Mm. There's definitely a noticeable... I wouldn't even go so smoking this. I, I, I get very little smoke from this. But it's fruity. Wow. Like dark fruits. I wouldn't go as far as saying cherries, but it does have a certain fruitiness to it. Oh no, hang on. So there's a, a good brewing term for you. Retronasal smelling. Once you've eaten something or drank something and you breathe out through your nose and then you, you basically re-receive some of the smell. Yeah, there is a smoke there is a smokiness to it. But it's really light and I think that's gonna work because I think giving too much of that beechwood punch in the face smoke that you can sometimes get. Mm. I think I, I take this is my favourite one to eat actually. This I could eat this all day. And for those of you who might be wondering why have I been eating the grains, you know, what's the point of eating the grains? I read in a book called Malt, which is part of a four-part series, it's quite a heavy book actually, uh, Malt by John Mallet. And he said you always have to eat your grains, because although the grain won't taste like how it will in the beer itself, you will be able to tell the difference between one grain to the next. So tasting something like crystal malt, and then tasting something like dark crystal malt just gives you that reference point of how, how much darker is dark crystal malt. What is the difference in flavour just between those two outside of the brew? And I think that can be quite useful for deciding how much of something you want to put in. You know, if it's a really powerful flavour, you know, steer away. Or if it's really subtle, you know, bring it up, that kind of thing. So, till next time. Uh, next time it should be the brewing process.